American Cassette Ministries welcomes you to the Breath of Life Crusade No. 2, featuring America's most powerful evangelist, Pastor C.D. Brooks. His topic is Infidel Night. And now, here is Pastor Brooks. Tonight, the title, Infidel Night, is a strange one, really. As a matter of fact, I want to say right off that that title is not meant as an affront to infidels. God loves infidels. And some of them are going to see the light. Some of them are just waiting for Christians to live what they profess. And some of them are going to be saved. One of the great infidels of the past was Bob Ingersoll. And according to history, Bob Ingersoll was always trying to discredit the Lord. And so he entered into a conspiracy with Lou Wallace, a novelist. And he said to Lou Wallace, you write a story about Jesus and make it authentic in every detail so that people will believe in it, except one thing involve Jesus in a scandal perhaps with Mary Magdalene and if you write that story and if it's true in every respect and you add that little ingredient then folk will lose faith in Christ and Lou Wallace decided he would do that but like many good writers he knew that if he was going to write it and make it true in every detail he had to study so he began studying the Gospels about Jesus and he found the pearl of great price and his heart was changed and instead of writing what Ingersoll wanted him to, to, to write he wrote that classic Ben-Hur in which Christ is lifted up as the Savior compassionate and glorious and powerful Jesus will save infidels our emphasis tonight really is on this business of doubt and fear to obey and uh, the, the, the idea that God's word is incredible, that it can't really be entrusted. I want to tell you why, one reason why, the devil attacks the Bible so. First of all, it is only through the Bible that Christ is revealed as man's hope of eternal salvation. If you don't get it from the Bible, it comes from no other source. Amen. And the devil knows if he can discredit the Bible in the minds of men, they won't find Christ. And that's the dirty trick he's pulling on folks. He is attacking the Bible because, as Jesus said in John 17, 17, Christ said, sanctify them through truth. Thy word is truth. It is through the Bible that the power of comes down to sanctify and to make holy, to show us in detail how God wants us to live and cause us to cry out for the power to live that way. We learn that through the Word. The devil knows that. That's why he hates the Word. Do you know that most people who knock the Word don't even read it? They don't know what it says. Folk who read the Bible don't talk that foolishly. It's people who haven't read it, who've just heard a few clever sayings, a few blasphemous sayings, and they think it's smart to quote it. You know, people actually think it's smart to doubt God. I ask you, is it smart to go to hell? People don't know God's word, and yet they sit in judgment on it. And it's amazing how much folk know about other things and how little they know about the Bible. Have you ever watched a quiz program on TV and you see these folk, they can give you all kinds of details about sports and about industry and about science and about most anything else. And then somebody throws them a Bible question. Who was swallowed by the whale? And they don't know. You ever notice that? And yet these are the people who sit in judgment on the Bible. I read once about two senators who had an argument about religion. And one of them said to the other, well, you don't know anything about the Bible. I'll bet you $25 you can't repeat the Lord's Prayer. And the other said, said, I'll take that bet. And he laid his money down. He says, all right, say it. And he said, no, I lay me down to sleep. I pray to you, Lord. When he got through, the other senator said, okay, you earned the money. I didn't think you knew it.
Ladies and gentlemen, people are condemning the Bible and they don't even know anything about it. I'll tell you something else. People condemn the Bible because the truths of the Bible condemn them. One reason folk are so busy picking the Bible to pieces is that they want to hold on to sins which the Word of God condemns. This is the problem, ladies and gentlemen. But I want to settle one thing right off here tonight. If I don't get to finish my sermon, if I can read this text, I've accomplished my purpose. Psalms 119 and verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Would you say amen out there? Now there's the solid rock. Forever, thy word is settled in heaven. In Matthew 24 and verse 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth may pass away, but my words will not pass away. Would you say amen? Amen. Not too long ago, my wife and I climbed laboriously up a steep and barren hill over near the shores of the Dead Sea. And from our vantage point, our guide pointed across a steep ravine to another hill with caves in it. And he said, those are the caves of Qumran. That's where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Well, if you were a Bible student, you were interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They found in old clay jars, scrolls made out of leather, containing the Word of God, dating back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And amongst those fragments, the most complete text was of the book of Isaiah. It was on a leather scroll, 40 feet long and 11 inches high. And when the scientists sprayed it and moistened it and opened it, They looked right smack dab in the middle of that scroll. And what do you suppose they read? They read Psalms 40 and verse 8. It says, the grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Would you say amen out there? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, people, people were impressed that these bits of scripture had been there for hundreds of years. I've got news for you. The word of God goes all the way back to the beginning and it stretches all the way into the future and the circle will be closed in eternity. The word of our God shall stand forever. It shall never pass away, though heaven and earth will pass away. This is proof of its divinity. That is, it is of extraordinary origin. For tradition has dug a grave for the Bible, but the Bible endures. Intolerance has lighted fires for the scriptures. Bibles have been burned in public squares in huge bonfires, but the scriptures endure. Many a Judas has betrayed the Bible with a kiss, and many a Peter has denied it with an oath. But the Bible still stands for truth never dies, though ages come and go. Though mountains wear away and seas retire, destruction lays earth's mighty golden cities low, and empire states and dynasties expire, but caught and handed onward to the wise, truth never dies. Folk don't like it, but it lives. People argue with it, but it lives. People lie about it. But it stands forever. Folk twist it and and misconstrue it. But it still stands. The word of God will not pass away. You try to tell an old saint that there's nothing to the word of God. You just try to tell somebody who's had the grace to read it and then to try God. My mother used to mark her Bible with a T. And I said, Mother, what does that mean? She said, that means I've tried that. I read it, and I believed it, and I decided to put God to the test. I've tried it. And it means in my Bible that God kept that promise, that he keeps his word, that he'll come through every time. I want to tell you there have been some some powerful infidels, but I have a book at home. It's an extraordinary book. It's written by a Ph.D., a Dr. Lockyer. The name of that book is The Last Words of Saints and Sinners. And that man laboriously combed through the libraries of the world to find out about the death scenes of famous people. And he wrote down, simply as his thesis, the last recorded words of these famous people who died. And the most amazing thing to me in that book is, all of these big shot, smart aleck infidels and atheists died screaming the name of God. 
Voltaire once said, in 50 years the Bible will be an exploded book. Well, Voltaire has been dead longer than that, and the Bible is still the world's bestseller. It is read in more languages than any other book under the sun. Voltaire died a liar, but that isn't all. He died calling on the name of God and saying that he was going to the realm of the damned. I was up in New Rochelle, New York, and I was following the trail of the patriots. And the man who was driving me took me out into a beautiful park, and there nestled amongst the trees was the home of Thomas Paine. The great American patriot. Thomas Paine was an infidel. Thomas Paine wrote a book called The Age of Reason. But then old Thomas Paine came down to die as all men must sooner or later. And Thomas Paine in this book, The Last Words of Saints and Sinners, died screaming the name of Jesus. He said, I would give worlds if I had them, if the age of reason had never been written. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Ladies and gentlemen, when a man presses a dying pillar without God, there's a difference in the way he dies and in the way a saint dies. I have a statement by a nurse, and this nurse attended in intensive care a dying infidel. And when the man was finally dead, she came out visibly shaken, perspiration on her brow. And she said, as long as I live and practice nursing, I don't want ever again to attend the dying infidel. It is a hopeless death. It is a death of fear. It is a death of struggle. But on the other hand, I've seen saints die. I've seen ordinary people die who knew God. I've seen people die who simply believed the Bible and they rested on it. They were able, even in death, to smile. The frown was gone. There was peace in their face. And they laid their heads down on the pillar and Jesus just bent over and kissed them to sleep. It makes a difference when you die. Whether you have the word of God or not. Would you say amen out there, beloved? Now you say, but I don't understand everything in the Bible. Well, I don't know who does. I've got certain heroes, you know, in the ministry. Martin Luther, founder of the Lutheran Church, is one of my heroes. I love that man. Love to study about him. The other is St. Paul. Two intellectuals. Maybe it's because I'm not. But St. Paul is considered the master intellect and the great preacher of the apostolic college. And yet Paul said in Romans 11 and verse 37, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, his ways are past finding out. Here was brilliant St. Paul. And yet Paul said God's wisdom is unsearchable. His ways are past finding out. Paul admitted he couldn't understand everything about God. But that didn't stop his faith. That which he did understand, he believed with all of his heart. And when Paul came down to die, he said to his Roman captors, I know in whom I have believed. And that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And then there was St. Peter in 2 Peter 3.16. Peter said, I can't even understand Paul. He says some things that are hard to be understood. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand up here preaching to you night after night. And I preach as one who believes because I do believe. But I don't understand everything. As a matter of fact, if I did, I think I would be a danger to myself. For the path of the just shineth more and more unto the perfect day. And our ability to understand does not depend so much on our brains as on our hearts. Would you say amen? For the Bible says spiritual things are spiritually discerned. When we seek the Lord humbly, when we recognize Him as God, when we plead for understanding, He gives us light as we are able to absorb it. And for the rest of our lives, we shall ever be learning. But what about those who doubt the word of the Lord? What proofs have I for reasonable men that we can trust God's word? I'll tell you what happened to me. I was called to preach and I went off. I was diverted from a school where I was already accepted to a seminary to study religion. And I remember I was only 16 years of age and I went off to college and I sat down by myself and I had a little talk with God. He knew how I felt. He knew I had my heart set on something else. And there I sat now getting ready for the ministry. And I said, Lord... I want to be sure about what I preach because I can't preach what I don't believe. I want a message. 
I want to be able to tell folks something that makes sense. I want truth so accurate that two plus two equals four. And it wasn't long after that that I sat in the classes of my professors studying Bible prophecy. And God let it click in my head. Here were things that God had said hundreds of years before and they come to pass accurately, mathematically correct. Hundreds of years later, I said, aha, this is my kind of God. A God who can tell the future and then it happens just as he said. I want you to jot these texts down. Isaiah 41, 21. Now here is God's challenge to the infidel and to the atheist and to the agnostic and to whoever is an unbeliever. It's Isaiah 41, 21. It is a little dark out there, but I hope you can get that down on your paper. God says, produce your cause, saith the Lord. Now get this, and, and see how reasonable God is. He doesn't just throw around his arbitrary might and slap people out of the way. God said in Isaiah 1, come now, let us reason together. And in this chapter, he says, produce your cause, saith the Lord. Now, you have something that you believe. You've got some idea. Let's hear it. Produce your cause. Bring forth your strong reasons. If you make up your mind you don't believe God, you ought to have a strong reason. I'd like to give you a warning. You'd better have a strong reason. Would you say amen out there? So God says, okay, let's hear your side. Bring forth your strong reasons. In verse 22, he said, let them bring forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things that we may consider them and know the latter end of them. Or declare us things for to come. Here is God's challenge. In verse 23, God said, show the things that are to come hereafter. That we may know that ye are God's. Would you say amen, church? Now that's God's challenge to the smart aleck generation that denounces the sure word of God. God says, all right, I have spoken and I'm God. Now, if you're smart enough to come up with something equal to what I've come up with, then you're God. Let me see your reason. You tell us what's going to happen in the future. And if it happens, then we'll know that you're God's. That includes Gene Dixon. And all those who write the zodiacs, fortune tellers, powder sprinklers, tea leaf readers, fortune cookie bakers, hair hiders, necromancers, spirit mediums. Are you listening to me? God says all of you who claim to have wisdom superior to that found in the word of the Lord, let's hear your side. Show us what's going to happen in the future that we may know that you are gods. Paul Harvey, the newscaster, collected all the major predictions from all of these folk for 1978. That's last year. He did this early this year. When he got them all together and sort of boiled them down into categories, he had 250 major prophecies made by these prophets, so-called, all around America, who are getting rich off this deception. Paul Harvey got all 250 of them together, and then he began to study to see how many of them happened, just like those folks said it would in 1978. Do you know how many came to pass? Six. I could do better than that just guessing. And yet these people are wealthy. Some of them are protégés of congressmen and senators. Some of them are, are honored in their communities. They have articles syndicated in a hundred newspapers. And it's all a bunch of foolishness. God says, if you've got it, let us examine it. And if it happens the way you say, then we'll know that you are God's. Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever heard that sickening cliche that you hear so much today, I've got to discover who I am? You, you heard that? It really gets under my skin a little bit. Sounds real clever, doesn't it? There are people in our society who are taking drugs, and if you ask them why, they'll say, I want to expand my mind so that I may discover who I am. They end up blowing their minds. 
We've got people today who are involved in all kind of immorality trying to discover who they are. I read an article by a woman who left her husband and babies. Now that's a radical step. A lot of women will leave their husbands but not their babies. This woman left husband and children and they interviewed her. She became a celebrity. And they said to her, why did you do it? And she acted as though she had just gotten a PhD from Yale University. She said, I did it that I might discover who I am. It actually gets on one's nerves. You know the Bible has already told me who I am. The word of God tells me where I came from. It tells me that God created me in his own image. And when I get it from the Bible, I not only know who I am and where I came from, I don't have any inferiority complex. I don't care what color a man is, he's just a man. I got that from the Bible. The Bible tells me about my past. Then the Bible also tells me why I am here. And it offers solutions for the present. The Bible gives me directions for the best possible life for me now. Even if there were no heaven hereafter, the Bible gives me the best prescription for the good life. And then the Bible tells me where I'm going. If I'm faithful, I have hope for the future. If I'm unfaithful, I'm going to hell. So all of these things are cleared up in the word of God. And yet people are out there ruining their lives and the excuse is, I'm trying to discover who I am. You tell them to read the Bible and they'll say, but I don't understand that. And yet they can understand tea leaves and rabbit's feet and four-leaf clovers. Isn't it ridiculous? An infidel one day said to Dwight L. Moody, the trouble with you Christian preachers is you are preaching a lot of things, but you don't know everything the Bible says. And Moody and that fellow had dinner together and they were eating fish. And Dwight Moody said to him, you like fish? Oh, yes. He said, do you eat the bones? Oh, no. He said, don't eat the bones. He said, what do you do with them? He said, I take them out and put them on the side of the plate. What do you eat? He said, I eat the meat, the part that's good. Moody said, that's the way I study the Bible. I don't pick bones. I take that which is good, which affects my life, which helps me to walk uprightly. That which expands my mind and creates intelligence. That's the part. The part that shows me Jesus and his shed blood. That's the meat of the thing. And I leave the bones for folks like you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to follow me now. We're going to touch on a little history on Infidel Night. I know that you all know from grade school there was a time when everybody believed that the world was flat. You remember that? In fact, there was one great philosopher who first espoused the idea that the world was round. He was thrown into prison and made to recant the idea. He was the laughing stock of the world. I think now we've come to the conclusion that the earth is round after all. Is that right? My wife and I got on a plane in New York City and we didn't stop flying until we came all the way around the world to, to Los Angeles and then right back to where we started from. I can tell you today the earth is round. As a matter of fact, you can get in one of these supersonic jets and they go up so far in the stratosphere, you can see the curve of the earth. The earth is round. But there was a time it was dangerous to say that. Do you know long before they got into this controversy, the Bible had said in Isaiah 40 and verse 22, it is he that sitteth on the circle of the earth. Let's say amen out there. Now if infidels and doubters had simply believed the word of God, they would have known this long, long, long ago. Not only that, but we read further in Job 22, 14, it, talking about God, it says he walketh in the circuit of the heavens. The earth is round and the Bible says so and had said so hundreds of years before men made the discovery. Usually the discoveries men make are simply those things they are catching up with that the Bible had already declared. Not only that, but there was a time when scientists believed that the moon was larger than the sun. And then one day they discovered they were wrong. 
They got some telescopes and they looked out there and saw that the moon was only about 250,000 miles uh, out there in space. But the sun is 93 million miles away and the sun is so much larger than the moon there's no need even discussing it comparatively. Well, don't you know in the book of Genesis... That's way back then, the first book of the Bible. It says God made the greater light to rule today and the lesser light to rule tonight. If folks had just believed what God said, they could have avoided that pitfall. Would you say amen out there? Infidels ought to listen to the word of the Lord. And everybody else who is an unbeliever. The Bible says the day will come when the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And for a long time, those of us who preached about the end of the world were laughed at. They said, oh, ha, ha, ha. there's some things that will not burn. Rocks don't burn. These buildings made out of brick and stone don't burn. These marble uh, buildings downtown won't burn. But then came the explosion of the A-bomb over Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. And men discovered something. Rocks will melt and steel will burn and run down the street like water. When God says something, you can put a pin in it. When God says something, you can count on it. And everybody who believes that, let me hear you say amen. 700 years. Now I'm rushing. We spent a lot of time on questions, so please keep up with me. 700 years before Jesus was born, a prophet was inspired of God to name the town he would be born in. Micah 5. Micah chapter 5, verses 2 to 7. Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. The text says, but thou, Bethlehem Ephrata. That's like saying Washington, D.C. Bethlehem of Ephrath. If you just say Washington, there are dozens of Washingtons all over the country. There's Washington, Pennsylvania, and Washington, New Jersey, and Washington here, and Washington there. But when you say Washington, D.C., that pins it down, right? So when the prophet named Bethlehem, he didn't just say Bethlehem. Folk might have thought he was talking about Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. He said Bethlehem Ephrata, Bethlehem out of Ephrath. And then the text says, though thou be little amongst the provinces of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come. Ladies and gentlemen, 700 years before the fact, God named a town and he picked out a little town. And God said it was little in the prophecy. And tonight we sing, oh little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. But you know, that isn't the amazing thing. The amazing thing is how God stuck his neck out on his word. Now God picks a town 700 years before Christ is to be born. If you and I were God, thinking the way we think, we would have chosen a virgin in Bethlehem, right? But God didn't do that. God chose a virgin in Nazareth. And I was over there, and I judged it 35 miles, and I was talking about it with a man who lives over there. He said, no, it's more like 75 miles away. So God chooses a town something like 75 miles away from the town he named 700 years before. That's sticking your neck out. God wasn't even playing it safe, was he? All right, now, if God chooses a town 75 miles away, then the next reasonable thing to do would be as soon as he uh, makes the annunciation to Mary, to have Mary and Joseph move down to Bethlehem and set up housekeeping. But he didn't. They kept their little old house in Nazareth. One month, two months, five months, six months, seven months. Babies come in nine months, eight months. Nine months, baby do any day, and Mary is 75 miles away. Now she's got to either get to Bethlehem or the Bible is a lie. And if you find a lie in it, I'm quitting this thing called the ministry. In fact, I'm going to quit the church. I'm not going to hang my soul on a book that can't be trusted. What do you say out there? Now, how in the world will God get the pregnant woman 75 miles away when they don't have helicopters and airplanes and ambulances and automobiles? They didn't even have a stream so she could be rowed down in a canoe. How in the world? Not only that, but what kind of man would make his wife travel 75 miles when she's expecting a baby any day? What could make a man do that? You've read it every Christmas probably in Luke chapter 2. It says in the days of Caesar Augustus that went forth a decree that all the world should be taxed. Ladies and gentlemen, when a decree went forth 
from Caesar. It was irrevocable. And he didn't care about Jewish women. He didn't care about anybody except Romans. You either did what you were told, you followed the decree, or you died. And so, ladies and gentlemen, whether he wanted to do it or not, Joseph had to take his wife. Are you following me? And so he got his little donkey out. And he padded that donkey well. And he put his wife on that donkey. And then they set out on a trip 75 miles with his wife expecting a baby at any time. This is the end of side one. Please turn over the cassette now for the continuation of Pastor C.D. Brooks' message entitled, Invitel Night. International copyright, 1986, American Cassette Ministries. All rights reserved. Once again, here is Pastor C.D. Brooks. Ladies and gentlemen, when a decree went forth from Caesar, it was irrevocable. And he didn't care about Jewish women. He didn't care about anybody except Romans. You either did what you were told, you followed the decree, or you died. And so, ladies and gentlemen, whether he wanted to do it or not, Joseph had to take his wife. Are you following me? And so he got his little donkey out, and he padded that donkey well, and he put his wife on that donkey. And then they set out on a trip 75 miles with his wife expecting a baby at any time. He had to travel more slowly than everybody else. And while he was going along slowly, everybody else rushed on past. And when he finally got there, all the hotels were filled. And all the rooms in the inns were taken. There were not any accommodations, whatever, left over. People were even sleeping in the streets and on the tops of the houses. They were there to obey the decree. The decree that had come from Caesar Augustus. And when Joseph went inquiring, he was desperate. He was pleading, what's wrong with you, Joseph? My wife is expecting a baby. Well, why did you travel? I had to. Why did you have to? Caesar said so. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, God said so. God said, out of thee, O Bethlehem, shall he come. Christ had to be born there. And when they couldn't find a room, he went into a stable. And away in a manger, no crib for his bed, the little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. But he laid down that head in Bethlehem. And the Bible came true. Would you say amen out there? Now, ladies and gentlemen, that speaks to my heart. In mathematics, you have what they call the law of probability. Then you have the law of compound probability. It is really the law of things happening by chance. And according to the law of compound probability, the chance of Jesus fulfilling that prophecy uttered 700 years before would be one chance in one with a hundred zeros behind it. And you can't even read a figure like that. Now, I wouldn't mind taking a chance if it's one in two or one in five. But the chance of this happening by accident was one chance in one with a hundred zeros. In other words, virtually impossible. That ought to speak to a reasonable man. When God says a thing will come to pass, it will come to pass. And God says to anybody else who doesn't believe his word, then you predict the future. And we'll know that you're God if it comes to pass. Would you say amen? Now I'll go to another. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 26, there is a city mentioned. It's called Tyrus. It's a city of Tyre. At the time, this was a great port city. It was a trade center. It was the New York of the Middle East. 
It was a prosperous, self-sufficient, proud city. At the same time, it was a wicked city, an immoral city. And finally, God uttered his judgment against that city. In verses 3 to 5 and 12 to 14, God said, I am against thee, O Tyrus. I'm going to destroy your walls. I'm going to break down your towers. And your city will be cast into the sea. When you read verses 12 and 14, God says they will lay the stones and the dust and the timber in the midst of the water. And thou shalt be built no more. Now this was a judgment being pronounced upon our great, big, powerful, rich, prosperous, secure city. And when the people heard the prophet, they laughed, they made fun of him, they made fun of his family, they made fun of his religion, they made fun of his God. And it didn't make sense at all. Nobody who was purely rational could look at this powerful city and believe that soon it would not only be destroyed, but it would be cast into the sea. Well, I got a rush. It wasn't too long after this that the laughter stopped. A Babylonian king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar attacked the city of Tyre. And when he had ravaged and sacked and plundered Tyre, the whole city was in ruins. It was not fit to live in. It was so totally ruined that the people who did remain moved away and left the city in ruins. But it wasn't in the sea. And for a hundred years, it wasn't in the sea. And for two hundred years, it wasn't in the sea. And for two hundred and forty-nine and a half years, it wasn't in the sea. But two hundred and fifty years after Nebuchadnezzar, there came along a great military strategist by the name of Alexander. You ever hear of him? He's called Alexander the Great. And he was marching down through that part of the world, conquering everything that he came in contact with. He waged war against Phoenicia. And when he came to this area that was in ruins, he looked out into the water a little piece, and there was an island out there. And the remnants of Tyre had gone on this island and built the wall, and then built a city, and that's where they lived. And when they saw Alexander, because there was some water between them and the land, they simply slammed the gate shut, and they wouldn't surrender. Alexander said to his soldiers, build me a causeway. Build me a road out to that island. And now what are you going to build it out of? They went into the city of Tyre where the ruins had lain for 250 years. And they start picking up those stones and those columns and all of those things that had lain there so long. And they hauled them out and dumped them in the sea. And after they had scraped the city and dumped it in the sea, they went back and scraped up the dust and the rocks in order to make it a little smoother for Alexander's horsemen. And when they got through 250 years after the prophecy, Tyre not only was destroyed, it was in the Mediterranean Sea. And the dust and the stones thereof were also in the Mediterranean Sea. Would you say amen to God tonight? I've been there. Go show you a picture tonight of me standing on the ruins of Tyre. The laughter stops when God speaks. There was another town called Capernaum. And in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said to Capernaum, Woe unto you, though you be exalted unto the heavens, you will be brought down to hell. What's wrong with Capernaum, Lord? Jesus said, if Sodom had seen what you've seen, The mighty works that I have done, if they had been done in Sodom, Sodom would have repented. But you have seen me, Capernaum. You have watched me heal the sick. You have watched me raise the dead. And still you won't believe. Thou shalt be brought down to hell. Tonight while we sit in this meeting on the north shores of the Sea of Galilee are the ruins of Capernaum. Never rebuilt. Oriental creepers have grown up and over the ruins of what was once a proud city. And snakes and lizards and 
horned toads are the inhabitants of Capernaum. That town that was blessed with the presence of Christ. When the Bible speaks, you can count on it. Would you say amen out there? I've got a lot of these illustrations. I'm going to skip all the way over now to the last one because I'm running out of time. And that is the city of Jerusalem. Jesus also blessed Jerusalem. He preached there. He healed the sick there. He taught the doctors there. One day, he drove the money changers out of the temple. And he said, ye shall not make my father's house a den of thieves. But they still returned recalcitrance for his entreaties. They would not obey. They would not believe. They turned against Jesus because he told the truth. They wouldn't let him preach in the temple anymore. They rejected him altogether. They taught the people to reject him. And finally, when time was winding down, Jesus sat on the side of a hill and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you as a hen gathered her chickens, but you wouldn't let me. Therefore, your house is left unto you desolate. And when the disciples heard this, they came to him and said, Lord, what do you mean by that? Jesus said, see ye not all these things? There shall not be left here one stone standing upon another that shall not be thrown down. Ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus said that, it didn't make sense except to those who believed in God. For Jerusalem was at the height of its glory. The domes of the temple were gold plated. The temple was refurbished in white marble, shipped all the way from Rome by King Herod. It was the most beautiful thing in the world at that time. It was so white and so bright and so brilliant that when the sun hit it, it seemed like it was on fire. And the Jews were proud of it. They thought it would stand forever. And yet here is Jesus saying, not one stone shall be left standing upon another. Ladies and gentlemen, about 40 years after Christ said that, Titus of Rome marched into Jerusalem. He tore down the gates. He began to hew down indiscriminately the old and the young, female and male. He killed even the animals that he came in contact with. The remnants of Jerusalem ran into the temple and shut the doors. Josephus stood on a block on the outside and pleaded with the Jews to surrender. He said, if you will surrender, the the general has promised to spare your temple. But they wouldn't surrender. They stayed in there until they got so hungry, they began to eat their belts and their sandals. And finally, a prophecy uttered by Moses in the book of Deuteronomy came to pass. The Jews stayed in there and got so hungry, women took their babies and roasted them on altar fires and sliced their flesh like slicing a turkey and ate their own children in fulfillment of a prophecy uttered 1400 years before. Are you listening to me? And finally, when they would not surrender, the Romans broke through. And with their short, broad swords, they began to kill everything in sight. And they slew so many people that blood ran down the aisles and down the white marble steps like crimson rivulets. And when it was all over, the temple was set afire. And the temple burned those cedar ceilings and and walls cedars brought from Lebanon those things were aged and cured and they began to burn and the whole temple caught fire and finally those golden domes turned red hot the heathen gathered on the hillside and when they saw what was happening they cried Ichabod Ichabod the glory is departed 97,000 Jews were taken back to be fed to the animals in the arenas of Rome And hundreds upon hundreds of thousands died in the carnage. Jesus said, your house shall be left unto you desolate. Oh, but you say that isn't all. He said not one stone would be left standing upon another. Historians record that when the fire had cooled, because there was so much gold in the temple, it had melted and had run down through the masonry. And in order for the looters to get the gold, they took chisels and hammers and dislodged the stones and took them down one by one to get the gold. And thus the word of the Lord came to pass exactly. Glory to God. His word is true. And it will stand forever. He has said in his word, I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I believe what God said, don't you? Let's get the screen down, please, and let's get the light off, and let's get the projector on, and I thank you very much. As this takes place, we want to close our meeting with a few thoughts illuminated on our screen. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 16, 25, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Ladies and gentlemen, may I make a suggestion respectfully? Don't ever stand your wisdom up against the Word of God. You can't win. Men have despised the Word, but have had to acknowledge it is the truth. Amen? Don't let your judgment, your opinion, stand between you and a thus saith the Lord. And the quicker you learn that lesson, the sooner you're going to have peace in your heart. I am a man who had to learn that. I learned, Lord, the simplest and the best and the easiest thing is to let God be true and let everybody else be a liar. That's why I want you to check on me when I preach to you. Don't just take my word. Go home and study. Look in your Bible. If it's not in there, I'm a liar. Let God be true. What do you say out there? You know, we've got people so foolish and so fickle that they will read a thing in the Bible as plain as their noses and then they will go and ask their preacher if God told the truth. You don't need to check on God with the preacher. You need to check on the preacher with God. There is a way that seemeth right, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Uh, we are going the wrong way. Let's keep it moving forward, please, Bob. Thank you very much. Let's go. All right. There are some who say we came from a monkey. Well, my Bible tells me where I came from. Therefore, there is not one iota of evolution that I believe in. How about you? Now, if you want to think you came from a monkey, that's your business. I think I was made in the image of God. And whatever went wrong with me that made me look like I look today, it's not the influence of monkey genes. It's sin in the human bloodline. Would you say amen out there? I believe God. There are some who read the story of Jonah and the whale and how they laugh. Well, I want to tell you something. It's not so incredible for me to think that God can make a fish big enough to carry a man when men can make supersonic jets that fly faster than a rifle bullet. What do you say? God ought to be able to do more than a man. Somebody reads that one day Jesus walked on the water. Ha, 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 they say. Nobody can walk on the water, and yet men have walked on the moon. They've gotten in rockets like that, and these rockets have been fired into outer space, and sooner or later, they went out there at 250,000 miles, and then he climbed down the ladder and put footprints on the moon. Now, if man can do that, don't you think God can walk on the water? After all, he created the water. Would you say amen out there? God is not a man. He's God. Let's go. You see people in darkness because they want to be. It's up to you. Which way are you going? Darkness or light? It's up to you. It's up to me. I've got to make that decision day by day. And all I need to know is what God says. I might not know the answer, but as soon as I understand what God says, then I'm in light. And I'm not afraid of the light. I'm not afraid of the Bible. There's that poem that I wish I could quote about the anvil. It talks about the anvil and the hammer. And the man bangs away on the anvil and he beats on it. But the anvil lasts while the hammer is worn out. Many an infidel hammer has beat away on the Bible. But those old hammers are in the grave now. The Bible still stands. What do you say? Now you're looking. That's not a bright slide. But those are the ruins of Tyre. And while I was over there, we looked out into the Mediterranean Sea. And here's what's left of the causeway built by Alexander. And it was built with the ruins of ancient Tyre. And there I stand. And if you were up here closer, you could look into that water and see columns. Carefully carved of marble and granite. They are in the Mediterranean Sea tonight. Just as God said way back there in the days of Ezekiel. And even though the city was in ruins for 250 years, finally the day came when Alexander fulfilled all of God's word and Tyre was cast into the sea. You can see some of the foundation stones over here to the right. And if you were up close enough to examine that, you could see those columns underwater today. It was a bit murky, so I couldn't get a real clear picture. But I'm a witness. And my wife took the picture. She's a witness. 
it's there today. And that's what's left of the city. Great men of all ages owe their greatness to some kind of faith in the word of God. Abraham Lincoln got so tired of the hypocrites who talked about the Lord and kept black folks in slavery that he wouldn't even join a church. But he believed in the Bible. And if you don't believe it, you read his writings. He was always quoting God Almighty. And if you go down there to the Lincoln Memorial and stand in what is called the most beautiful memorial on earth and then turn to your right and read Lincoln's second inaugural address, he pays homage to God of our fathers in that mighty address. Would you say amen? Men who amount to something a man who are influenced by the word take Booker T. Washington a man for his time a great man believed in the word of God the revolution never could have gotten off the ground in America had there not been a man who believed in the word of God Dr. Martin Luther King I remember once I was in Atlanta, Georgia and a certain preacher was on the radio and he was blasting white people with a kind of hatred and, and invective that made me tremble and, and I said to myself what hard things he's saying that afternoon I went to that same preacher's church to hear Dr. King I sat right on the, 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 the lip of the stage and listened to that great man speak and the first thing he said to that audience was you've got to love your enemy you've got to do good to these men who despitefully use you you got to turn the other cheek non-violence he said is not only a way it's the only way where did he get that he studied the philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi but he was a Christian preacher and he read those words from Christ himself good men have nearly always been men who had faith in the Bible and today that's the book for all the world I put that slide on for a reason you see that black fellow there you know who that is that's Mr. Kilby our music director when he was a youngster he was painted by a rather outstanding artist but what that picture indicates is that all people of all races and creeds need the word of the Lord would you say amen to that out there and now, uh, having said that, it's time for us to at least study God's Word before we start passing judgment. It's time for us to look in that Word and see what God will say to us. And I want young people to know it's not a dull study. No, sir, whatever you want is there. If you want history, it's there. If you want adventure, it's there. If you want poetry, it's there. If you want romance, it's there. Read the Song of Solomon. It's there. Whatever there is that you enjoy, it's in the Word of God. The difference is, it is the truth, and it speaks to the soul, and it has power in it to cleanse the mind. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Asked the psalmist David. He said, by taking heed to the Word of God. You study God's Word. You pray over it, and you'll see a difference in your life, for there is power in the Word, and it's time for us to get back to the word and you never had it so good as when you begin to study the word of the Lord when you begin to study it and then when you don't understand it you pray about it and you've got something else going for you not only will you read the word and understand that but then the Lord through the Holy Ghost will enlighten your mind and will give you insights that other folks don't have and you'll be able to look out and face the future unafraid because you have hid the word in your heart that you might not sin against God. We stand in need of the word. Washington, D.C. needs the word of God. America needs the word of God. If we paid heed to the word of God, they'd close up all of these hell holes up and down the streets. If people paid heed to the word of God, it would be safe to walk the streets of your community. If people paid heed to the word of God, racism and bigotry would disappear. If people paid heed to the word of God, we'd all be brought together in one common denomination. Would you say amen out there? It's what we need. And when you study the word, it cleans you up. I remember once preaching a sermon, and I had a good example in front of me, and I told the people, you know what? When a man starts living in harmony with the Word of God, it not only cleans up his soul, it cleans up his body. It washes his face. It combs his hair. The Word of God and the power of the Gospel will brush your teeth. It'll put an intelligent look on your face. 
It'll make you clean, attractive, and yet modest. You look like somebody when your life is under the influence of the word of the Lord. You want to see a contrast? There's the other side. Thank God for the word tonight. Thank God in a time of danger, it points the way. We can go to bed at night with all the strategic arms and with all the threatening of various nations and powers. We can go to bed at night and sleep like a baby because we have the comfort of the word of God. This world is sinking into sin. And the devil knows the only thing that will point the straight and narrow way to eternal life is the word. That's why he doesn't want people to respect it. That's why he wants us to forget about it. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The only place you're going to find that is in the word. So the devil figures if he can get people to disobey and to disregard and to ignore the word, they'll never find out that God said, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The devil knows what he's doing when he belittles the word and when he creates doubts. He knows you won't find a savior if you ignore the word. He knows that Jesus died in vain. Hung on a cross for nothing unless you will study the word and believe the word. The devil knows what he's doing when he attacks the word. The pitiful thing is people don't know what they're doing. They think it's clever. They think it's smart. But all they're doing is buying a one-way ticket to destruction. Tonight, beloved, I challenge you. On the basis of the things we've discussed, and I could have gone on all night, I challenge you tonight, believe God. Believe His prophets. And the Bible says, so shall ye prosper. Tonight, I for one believe the Word. That's all I can preach. That's why I'm here. The Word. Take that away. I got nothing to say. My opinion's no better than yours. Isn't worth a dime without the Word. And they are religions built on tradition. They are religions built on opinion. They are religions built on one man and what he thought. Some of them are as ridiculous as what happened in Guyana. And some of them are as clever and sophisticated as some of these other things you know about. But all of it is error. Only that which is built on the unquestionable authority of the word of God is built on a rock. Tonight on Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. And as long as my belief and my faith and my preaching are anchored in the word of God, I am safe and I will not mislead anybody. Thank God for the word. What do you say? Now I'm determined that the word shall guide me now. And I'm determined that as God reveals it, I want to believe it. I want grace tonight to do what the Word says. And if Pastor Brooks tells you something that's not in the Word, you don't have to do it. Is that fair enough? If I come up with some clever stuff that is not anchored in the Bible, forget it. Now, am I being fair? Now, having said that, those truths that will come out of the Word, and you can read them yourself and you know that it's there, do you want grace to do what God's Word says? If you do, I want you to indicate that desire by standing with me for the closing prayer. And let's be sincere right now. And let's tell God, I want to believe the word. I want to follow the word. I want my life shaped, shapen by the word. I want my life filled with the word. I want my life obedient to the word. Is that what you mean by standing? If it is, say amen. Let us pray. Lord, it's time to go home. But you see us stand. And I pray that you would honor our faith. In Jesus' name. And bind thy word to our hearts. There is someone who cares. When you just can't believe. There is someone who cares. Though you doubt the things you receive. There is someone who cares. Your troubled soul he'll relieve. That someone who cares is Jesus. There is someone who cares when uncertainties assail. There is someone who cares when fears hound your trail. 
There is someone who cares. His word will never fail. That someone who cares is Jesus. And now may his grace and his peace and his efficacious blood and his love and his protection and his providence and his leadership and his word fill your life. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Peace in your hearts. Peace in your homes. Don't forget that tomorrow night our subject is what is love? A different kind of a message perhaps straight from the word of God. We're going to have special prayer for those who feel a special need tomorrow night. So come and bring your loved ones and bring your friends. Bring your neighbors and your children. Practice carpooling. Oh Lord, keep us and bring us back at that time. We humbly beg in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor C.D. Brooks speaking in the greater Washington, D.C. area, The Breath of Life Crusade No. 2, International Copyright, 1986, American Cassette Ministries, All Rights Reserved. This series of 30 cassettes is protected by international copyright and thus protected by federal law against all copying, duplication, and transcriptions. Please understand it is unlawful to copy this cassette for any purpose. For additional copies of this important series, Breath of Life Crusade No. 2, catalog number BL3, as well as other cassettes by Pastor C.D. Brooks, please write for our free gift catalog. Our address, American Cassette Ministries, Post Office Box 922, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The postal zip code is 17108 in the United States of America. And if you would like to order today using your Visa or MasterCard for orders of $25 and more, or perhaps you'd like to request a smaller order sent to UPS COD, please dial our nationwide toll-free order line, 800-233-4450. In Pennsylvania, Alaska, Hawaii, Canada, and other countries, please dial area code 717-652-7000. Waiting to serve you, this is American Cassette Ministries. We're a nonprofit corporation helping prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ.